Welcome back to our program of the IDSF. Uh, our next topics, as mentioned uh, before, are digital resilience and, and complexity. And our session host is uh, Alexander Schatten, senior researcher of SBA Research. Um, yes, uh, we are going to discuss how to handle complexity and emergent uh, properties of distributed software uh, systems and the consequences for security and uh, resilience of these systems. And Alexander ha has some, some experience with these complex uh, systems. He has a quite uh, colorful educational history uh, studying chemistry, philosophy, and computer science. Um, he was an assistant professor at the Vienna University of Technology with the focus on complex and distributed software systems. Um, left the university starting at IT startups and several companies, and uh, we are glad we have him here today as a senior researcher um, of SBA Research. Handing over to you, Alex. Thank you. Thank you very much for the introduction. Yeah. Ah. <laughs> Thank you very much for the introduction. Yeah, I think we're going to have a very interesting session today. I'm here on the panel with two, I think, ex two exceptional uh, guests. One is Andreas Windisch, Dr. Andreas Windisch from uh, No Center. Hi. We're going to talk a little bit later. He's uh, uh, an excellent physicist, mathematician, and expert in artificial intelligence, machine learning, these topics. And on the, other, on the other side of the panel, we see Dr. Lukas Feiler, also with a very interesting background because it's not so often that a lawyer has a deep background in technology. So I think we're going to see that we have an interesting, uh, yeah, interesting migration of the topics uh, coming up. Let me just give you two, three words of introduction to, to set the topic of the session today. Digital, resil digital, digital resilience and complexity. I think we have a web of uh, interacting aspects that influence each other uh, and in potential uh, dangerous ways. And I would say the topics we are going to touch today are innovation and progress. So what is the difference between innovation and progress? Complexity and maintenance. And in effect, the aim for a resilient society. And a resilient society with the specific aspect of information and com com communication technology. So what about innovation and uh, progress? I think there's a lot of innovation talk these days in the sense of uh, we put innovation very much in the foreground. And I think innovation is only one cog in a bigger machinery because what we actually want is progress in the society. Evolution cannot be explained by mutation alone, so there are other aspects that are very important, such as selection and cooperation. So we have to select what type of innovation do we want to develop in a way so that we achieve progress. Cooperation society, how do we come up with conclusions? How do we come up with legal frameworks, with technical frameworks? That's just in terms of uh, that requires generalists, that requires an interdisciplinary approach. We also have a risk management and precautionary measures because new technologies, new ideas, innovation always have a certain amount of risk involved with them that we often cannot assess easily in the beginning, as I think we will see. Uh, and finally, we have the topics resilience, maintenance, and sustainability. Why resilience? I think progress needs to lead to a resilient society. We don't want a society that becomes fragile, that becomes vulnerable. So everything that counts as progress has to be resilient in a certain uh, um, way. So now, what is resilience? Resilience is the capacity of a system to adapt to changing situations that we are going to face in our time uh, and change with these uh, yeah, attacks also to a system. Now. Uh, let's get to, to the uh, topic of complexity and maintenance. Interestingly, the late David Graeber said something very, quite interesting. He said, you buy a coffee mug once, but you wash it a thousand times. So what we underestimate in our society is the importance of maintenance. Every new system that we introduce, every innovation that we introduce into our technical stack becomes infrastructure over time. And by becoming infrastructure over time, we have to maintain it. If we do not maintain it, then we have a non-sustainable system. So how can we achieve that as a society? Number one. Number two, if we do not make the introduction of new systems in our technical stack well enough, we risk that the complexity explodes. And by exploding complexity, we get a system that you don't have under control anymore. And now let's maybe switch to Andreas Windisch. Andreas, I think we all, on first name basis, uh, Andreas, you are a physicist, so uh, 
physics is one of the often poster child sciences over the last 100, 200 years you achieved incredible uh, scientific progress like in predicting a lot of physical systems from quantum physics to relativity theory. Uh, so amazing what physics achieved. So now my question would be, okay, now we have big data, artificial intelligence, all of that. So it, it's only a matter of uh, years, right, until we can predict our society and can predict the effects of, uh, of what we do. Okay, so um, thank you very much for the, for the intro and for uh, bringing up that question. So I think we have, um, we're living in really, really exciting times uh, when it comes to uh, progress that we made over the past 150 years or so in physics. And uh, interestingly, historically, it was like, uh, you know, at the end of the 19th uh, century, people believed that they had solved kind of uh, many of, of uh, standard problems in physics. But it turned out... The world out, is understood, right? Yeah, exactly. And uh, so, like, you know, why would you go in physics in the first place? So because it's pointless. Everything's known. Everything's done. But then, uh, later, throughout the, the, the century, um, it turned out that there are worlds people weren't even aware of. The whole quantum world uh, is out there and was discovered and opened up new opportunities uh, and uh, really also a very fascinating world that kind of shows how our universe and how nature works on the smallest scales. So that is an amazing um, feat that people pulled off here. And um, a lot of progress uh, has been made, but uh, unfortunately also with finding uh, those new fields, a lot of new questions came up. And we are far from being able to address those from many different points of view. Mathematically, we are struggling because we cannot solve those things in a rigorous fashion. So there are mathematical kind of boundaries that we are that we have to deal with. And uh, you know, I, I could go on. So I don't know. Just stop me. No, my, if you... my, no my, my thesis would be because you made you made the, the, the move from the 19th to the 20th century. My thesis would be, but maybe you you oppose my view here, is that physics in the 19th century was more focused on simpler deterministic systems, so like reducing the complexity of the system to understand like the elementary processes of our world. But physics more and more opened up to, if you will, the real world. And now we have like biological systems and all of that, which try to use similar methods maybe as physics or physicists used also mathematically, you're a mathematician too. And suddenly my feeling would be that we are in a different world. We're not in the world anymore that we had in the 19th century. In uh, terms absolutely. Of complexity. Yes, uh, definitely. But also uh, I think one of the, the biggest achievements um, here is that uh, experimentally on, and also theoretically, we progress to much, much smaller scales uh, at very big costs. And I mean, really costs, if you think of like, uh, you know, particle accelerators at like the LHC at CERN, um, which you can use to resolve the smallest distances where quantum excitations happen and where you can uh, get ideas of how fundamental particles interact. And uh, if, if you want to build such a structure, it's a huge, like ginormous uh, effort, you know, that, that takes a lot of money, a lot of effort, uh, technical skill and engineering skill. It's amazing that they actually were able to do that. And also on, on the mathematical side, because if you try to resolve those fundamental processes, and if you think of the simplest, most simple process that can occur at, at um, you know, a particle level, like a particle propagating from A to B through space time, say, this in itself in the vacuum, so no temperature, no other particles around, just this process in itself is so complex that we cannot solve it in a rigorous fashion. Yeah, but Andreas, this is sort of disappointing now. I mean, now you studied <laughs> mathematics and whatnot, and now we have IT, we have big data, and, and, and the companies tell us we just have to collect data, collect data, and from data derives decision because the, I, the AI systems knows what's going on. But so this is not, uh, it's not fitting together, is it? Um, well, so, uh, you know, uh, let's, let's take a step back maybe. So in, in theoretical physics, we try to really kind of understand these things on a fundamental level. So we have theories and uh, we have uh, certain assumptions that we put to the test experimentally. And uh, what we strive for is really that we have a fundamental understanding that we really have put down a model with all, all the, uh, you know, fundamental degrees of freedom, the building blocks, like the Lego bricks that you can take and you can build a Lego house or a Lego car. So very much in that fashion, we try to achieve that. On the other hand, uh, over the past decades, uh, decades there was this uh, huge um, progress in, in machine learning 
uh, which is also a very interesting field. Um, and if, if you consider, not all of it is data driven, but if you consider the data driven part, of course, you can collect more and more data, you can study it, you can make predictions based on that data, where you have some machinery learning on that data but uh, your predictions will always be limited in certain sense in a certain sense so first off in in any real world application normally what happens is that you're facing non stationary distributions meaning that the data you you kind of train your system on changes over time simply because systems are non stationary they change and then your predictions will fail to be good because the system never learned that so because that, the predictions are always relying on hi history in exactly mm -hmm. yes so there are of course strategies as of how you can mitigate that but that is certainly an issue another problem that you often have is that you kind of um, you know you can train your system, but uh, and you can uh, I don't know classify or regress some value, whatever. Make your predictions, but you don't have any insights as of why that is. So therefore, um, you know, because you said uh, you know now we have big data, and, and of course you you really pushed it to the limit uh, in, in in by formulating it that way. But uh, you know, if you uh, are now saying okay, we have this huge amounts of data, so we have everything figured out. Uh, by far not, of course, because even though we, we might be able to make some limited prediction in, in various, even complicated systems, we are far from understanding uh, the, the problem and the system itself uh, just by, you know, fitting some huge machinery with, with tons of parameters. So if I understand you correctly, we have at least two issues at hand here, at least. The first would be that we are always relying on data, and data is always by definition from the past. So, I mean, it can, of course, update, but it, at the point in time, the data, the, mach the, the machines learn always from the past. So we are sort of always making it kind of interpo interpolation uh, of past experiences that the system had with all the problems that the data might not be accurate or it might, we might have data quality issues, we might have not collected the right data. So all of, all of, all of that things involved, I would say this is sort of one dimension of problems, That right? is certainly one problem that people are facing and that has to be addressed in some way, yes. And the other one that you opened up was like that the system might decide or might, yeah, might make decisions, but we actually don't really know why it comes to a certain conclusion. That is another thing, yeah, it's like a black box system. That is uh, definitely another problem and there are tons of other problems out there uh, depending on what yeah, the system yeah. is and what kind of uh, prediction you want to you want to make or control or whatever. Because I I see a little bit the issue today that a lot of, lot in this area of um, let's say artificial intelligence and, and IT, a lot of hype is made and I, I think a lot of marketing departments or let's say also seed investors are speaking and try to promise a lot of things where I'm not sure that the promise is justified. So like we have a lot of these data-driven companies that explain to us, we just get the data and you get healthy and you get all, all, and all of that sort. And maybe even political decisions can just be arrived from, uh, I don't know, a lot of data or the legal system. Maybe we just collect another, enough uh, data and then we can judge everyone <laughs> in a fair manner or something. something Surely not. <laughs> you know, yeah. Maybe something of that sort, right? And so when I listen to you, I have the impression that we probably are facing some fundamental limits in prediction and predictability and always in the way the systems can support us. Or did I misunderstand that? No, most definitely so. So um, I think that uh, there are bound. So I, I don't want to make a hard statement because I don't know. Maybe there are ways around it. I, I don't know any. And uh, I think we don't know any, we as mankind so far. But there are certain uh, boundaries where you simply are limited by what you can predict. So, like, if you think like of, uh, I don't know, a, a complex system, society or the stock market or, or something like that, this is a system where you have so many degrees of freedom and uh, you have many, uh, you know, you have unknown unknowns in the system. So there are things in there you don't even know that you don't know there are. So th they must be in there. And, uh, you know, you have all sorts of, uh, you have nonlinear dynamic. You have uh, causal effects that can, uh, you know, not be traced or, or tracked back. So in such a system, how would you mm. uh, kind of amplify a small signal that determines the fate uh, mm. of, 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 of the system as it progresses? Yeah, and, the, and this unknown unknown seem to be, um, maybe if I understood it correctly, uh, system theorists talk about emergent phenomena often, 
and, and the idea there, as far as I understand it, is that you have an interaction of a lot of uh, individual parts that form a complex system, mm -hmm. and then suddenly you have, you observe behavior, you observe patterns that cannot be easily reduced to the underlying uh, parts of the system. And these emergent properties are obviously extremely important in our society because you brought the example of like, for instance, stock market trading. Now when you start like today, there's not like, I don't know, remember this, this from the old movies where the traders were standing and shouting in, I don't know, yeah. in, the, in the, the stock exchange. Today, no one is, maybe they shout because they lost a lot of money, <laughs> but not because they trade like that. Today you have systems that trade in milli or nanoseconds, I don't know what. And it is to be expected that you see emergent effects that you didn't predict, right? Well, those high-frequency traders, I guess, um, those systems, they are really tapped by using, you know, fiber class uh, wiring into the stock exchange, and they make decisions on highly specialized processors that really, hard, on a hardware level, to pick the algorithm to come up with, with quick decisions. So I think on a short, very short time scale, there will always be... Uh, some benefit, or you can always uh, benefit from making decisions on very short time scales, because in within very short time scales, I guess you can get away with making uh, at least some predictions. But on the long run, mm -hmm. such a system, uh, I think, um, yeah, that that won't work so well. And we and we and we, and we saw the systems I think of like these uh, flash crashes, right? There were like at least one or two flash crashes I'm aware of where suddenly like the, the, the stock market dropped for I don't know how many points in, it, a, yeah. mm -hmm. in a dramatic fashion. Mm -hmm. And what was surprising for me was like afterwards experts analyzed this situation for months and could not really pin it down properly why that actually happened. This would be such an emergent phenomenon, maybe a black swan uh, that, yeah. that hit you there, no? Yeah, I guess so. So, but in, in, if you now go back to the original question, if you have such a system and you train on data, such uh, predictions that you would like, you know, that the stock market plummeting, you wouldn't capture that mm. given historic data. So, so, so in principle, this would not be predictable, right? Not predictable, at least not with the mm. methods uh, yeah. we have at hand. But we come to, a, to another very interesting point. I think this is also a, a very interesting anchor point for our discussion, the legal discussion afterwards, is like, okay, but there are actors in the game, right? So there are like, for instance, there are traders or there are like politicians and there are no regular people or there are computer systems, whatever you want. Mm -hmm. Maybe let's stick rather to, to, to human actors mm -hmm. first. So like they have like incentives, they interact with each other. And there are also some mathematical ideas or concepts that you could use to describe that, right? Sure. I mean, in principle, you can, um, whenever you have, uh, you know, a setup with uh, certain players, you can like think of it in a game theoretic setup, for example. And uh, there the question for each individual player would be what is the optimal strategy uh, given the rules of the game. But now here's the interesting thing in such complex systems, um, the rules are maybe not so clear because the rules themselves, I guess, are emergent phenomena in the sense as we discussed uh, earlier. Because uh, I mean, from the outside, of course, there are certain rules being enforced and there are rules of society and, and whatnot. But the game itself mm. uh, adjusts, uh, I would say, or has emergent rules uh, that, that just pop up. So if we take a particular type of our economy, I don't know, let's stick with the financial markets, if, if you will. So you have like the traders, you have the banks, you have, I don't know which actors you mm -hmm. want to include here now. So if I understand it correctly, you say, they of course acting under some external boundaries, or at least yes, are supposed yes. to. This could be like the external rules of the system. Like when we play chess, we don't just introduce a new rule. So chess, in that sense, would be a simple, uh, uh, definitely a simple yes. phenomenon yes. because uh, the rules are fixed. So they are just externally. Absolutely. But let's let's get back to the chess thing. Okay. Later. But uh, okay. Let me just okay. The second point that you say is. But we have a complex interaction and we probably have emergent phenomena. So actually, probably a part of the rules are actually emerging out of the system. So we would have two type of rules or two ways how rules come into play, is that? Yes, I mean, there are, of course, uh, not all players uh, f would follow a rational strategy. So therefore, this is, of course, uh, just a theoretical concept and can only be used to some extent, I guess, since you don't know how rational your other players will decide. But uh, in addition to that, of course, like if you have a, uh, like a rule framework imposed from the outside and uh, there are loopholes that would 
be to the benefit of certain players, they would exploit it. So therefore, mm. the external rules are not the ones ah. that would be used, but you know those bent rules kind of. Uh, so th try so to work around. Again, that. a very interesting topic. We're going to pick, definitely pick up later on. Uh, if the rules get a certain amount of complexity, it's not easy to even estimate anymore how the rules would work out. Because in chess, the rules are relatively simple. You know how the figures move. I mean, a complex dynamic appears within the chess. So the, I would say that the, the patterns that emerge within the chess are sort of complex. Otherwise, it would not... So uh, that's the point why I, I, okay. uh, why I kind of um, wanted to go back to the chess issue. Of course, uh, th there was this huge achievement in 2016 or whenever it was when uh, a, an AI machine learning based system was trained to play Go on a, uh, you know, on a world class player level. And uh, Go as chess also, those are both games that are that can be considered as being simple in the sense of uh, we know the rules, we know mm -hmm. exactly uh, what the legal moves and are. And easy to teach. And uh, Well, if by teach you meaning teaching somebody the rules, that's easy. Teaching somebody to win, that's yes, the hard yes. part. But that's an interesting part that I also discuss with the students because I think this is very interesting with chess. Because if I'd never played chess and you're a grandmaster, I'm sure you can teach me the rules in five minutes. Yes. So in five minutes I can play against you. Yes. So I master the game in the sense of I can play against you. You master the rules. You don't master the game. No, no, I master the game in the sense I can play within the rules against you. Okay. That, that's what uh, I mean. If, if, if that's okay, it's matter of but definition. But the question is, will I win against you? And the answer is not for a very, very yes. long time, right? But but that's the thing. So uh, I think those type of problems, and that's a huge achievement still, uh, like beating, uh, a, you know, or becoming a world class player in Go. The the space of possible moves that you've got is just, you know gigantic, it's, it's huge. And building up an intuition in such a space, learning, okay, this move is a good move. If you're only told like uh, at the end of the game, yeah, you won, so you did good, or you lost, so you, you did not so good. Um, you have to figure out what moves are, uh, you know, strategically well for any possible mm. configuration in a configuration space, which is so in, like huge that you cannot um, even, you know, I think it exceeds the number of atoms or something mm. in the universe. So it's really uh, gigantic. And the chess and rules don't even allow for a lot of loopholes, right? Opposed to a lot of <laughs> our society rules. That in addition. So I think those type of problems where you have a big search space and uh, you have to find uh, good strategies in those spaces, this is a particular type of, uh, um, of, of problems, uh, which is, of course, very interesting to solve and also historically, of course, relevant because it was chess, it was Go, and, and these kind of uh, things because chess was, of course, also widely uh, regarded uh, and still is, I guess, as being the ultimate uh, test of mind and, and, you know, brilliance or whatever. This, this opens an interesting question to me now, as you mentioned that, because I have the impression when you look back historically, historically, I mean, like in the 50s, 1950s, 60s, because the first ideas of artificial intelligence, Alan Turing and all of Turing mm -hmm, tests mm -hmm. and all of that, and interestingly, in the beginning, as far as I remember, that I mean, not remember personally, but I mean remember from, uh, from, from literature, is the focus was on chess and this and this sort of achievements because I think at the time, chess was understood as a test for intelligence or a test for creativity and so on. Mm -hmm. And my feeling is that the goalpost shifted also a little bit in the terms that we now see, well, chess is actually not such a measurement of intelligence or it's more like a measurement of pattern recognition maybe something like that when we deal with actual complex problems in society uh, we are having an entirely different different it's, it's certainly very different also chess became kind of you know you have to know your openings and you have mm. to study them in, intensely in order to be in, uh, you know and, and it goes many moves down the road until they're out of the books so to speak uh, out of the opening and the mm. game starts evolving so this definitely changed uh, uh, dramatically but if you now go back to society those problems are completely different mm. because there aren't any simple rules you can tie the evolution of the system to but they are emergent they are uh, non-linear they are you know arising because of some hidden interactions among different things, so it's it's unclear. And I think here we're just hitting a, fu a fundamental wall of what we can actually predict. So therefore, um, so yeah. No, 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 but, but just uh, because what you said now is I think extremely important in, because to come back to our, one of the core topics of what day was not only complexity, it was also resilience. Now, when I talk about resilience, so if I want to have a system that is, that is resilient, mm -hmm. I would say I have in principle two ways I, I can go forward. Mm -hmm. I can either go forward in the sense of 
I can predict very well what's going to happen. Mm -hmm. So I can prepare for what's going to happen or I can change the system early enough because I know what's going to happen. So this would be the traditional risk management prediction mm -hmm. move. Okay. But then we seem to have problems that are simply in, in our complex society, they're simply not predictable, mm -hmm. more or less by definition not predictable, mm -hmm. for all the reasons that you mentioned before. Mm -hmm. uh, but it means we need a different strat strategy to handle those type of problems mm -hmm. because otherwise we run into an extremely fragile society uh, that we cannot handle anymore. Well, um, I, I agree with the first part, most definitely. So I, I, I think um, those big questions, and like for example, um, the other day uh, I attended a, a presentation that a friend of mine gave on um, on sustainable energy in mobility. And uh, that is a very complex uh, topic because, uh, so he presented slides over slides and he did great. It was a really interesting thing. And uh, one thing that I took away from, from what he presented was, so you have all those charts where they study, you know, CO2 emission uh, for a particular whatever car, say, and considered from uh, throughout the lifetime where the car was driven. Then some other data that comes from uh, taking into account from the well, meaning, you know, all, all the natural resources as they're prepared, taken into account into the CO2 emission. But then you can also study, for example, the part where the car's uh, not being driven anymore, mm. but is being processed uh, to, you know, be recycled or whatever and disposed. So that again has some emissions and you can consider the whole thing mm. like uh, he, he called it from cradle to grave, the whole life cycle, including all those other parts. And if you now uh, look at those individual charts and mm. statistics and you, you, know, you try to make conclusions, it is very easy that you kind of uh, are lost in this complexity or you pick some data that has been considered in one of mm -hmm. those subparts and you pick some other from there and you, you take and you optimize a &E. this, but uh, maybe on the cost of the other. Exactly. So that's the problem. And, and I think we, we are facing this in, in many different systems. And I'm sorry, and you didn't even, you didn't even mention here now that, that the meta problem, what we know like as uh, rebound effects. For instance, a car is a good example. Uh, for instance, like... Today, electric cars are marketed by being cheaper uh, to operate because mm -hmm. the electricity is cheaper than the, mm -hmm. than the gasoline, for instance. Now, if that is true in the long run, this will change the way we use the cars. We already see that in statistics today, to my knowledge, that electric cars are used more than traditional cars because the purchase might be more expensive, but the driving actually is cheaper, mm -hmm. so you drive more. Of course. So yeah. suddenly, what I want to say is, not only are all these parts that you mentioned mm -hmm. very complex, also, over time, the system develops in a way that you simply have a very hard time to predict. Yeah, I think you cannot. Yeah. And of course, there will be incentives, by, in, incentives created by markets, by uh, decisions from politics or whatever, that kind of uh, you know, steer you towards using one or the other option for transport. Like it was like uh, you know, the diesel engine was, mm. was like, uh, you know, whatever, a few decades back, very attractive because of financial reasons, financial reasons, I guess. So, and, and this is, uh, these kind of problems you're facing in many complex systems. And uh, I think making really robust predictions in such systems is pretty much. Okay, then, then let's, then, okay, I understand the robust predictions are out the window. So uh, now, I'm, now I'm disappointed, so what are we doing now? <laughs> so uh, I think in, in such cases, like uh, in those wicked problems um, yeah, that yeah. we were uh, discussing, um, not here, but, but before, um, so, these kind of problems, I guess, you have to have a strategy where you uh, try to understand the system as good as you can, even though you know mm -hmm. that you cannot fully understand yeah. it. You take small steps. You have to kind of monitor the system and the outcome, and you have to correct it all the time. It's sort of a moving target where you constantly adjust to... Exactly, yeah, yeah, exactly. So even the optimization goal is a moving target because the yeah. kind of knobs you yes. have to turn change over time, and maybe you have to turn here at some point, but somewhere else down the road to... to you know, uh, steer it back to where we want it to be. But I have to say, we are not making Lucas happy, I think. He's starting <laughs> sweating more and more because all of these things you have to, <laughs> how do you say in English, Ausbaden, you have to sort of uh, <laughs> suffer from that because you I have to... have to solve it all. You have a lot to solve <laughs> on the legal side to, to get that under control, right? Because we have, you say we have moving targets, we cannot predict far ahead. This is all not very comfortable for the legal system, right? I think we're going to have to... We'll have lots to talk about. Exactly. <laughs> okay. So this is the one part. So we have we have to act in a. We cannot 
predict our actions in, in, in the long run. But I think there's a second point that I believe is important. I don't know what your opinion to that is. I think we have to urgently try to avoid systems that are tight coupled that lead to, so to put it the other way around, um, Nassim Taleb always says that the way to go forward here is not to try to predict, but to try to avoid catastrophic outcomes in case something goes wrong. So mm -hmm. let's stick to the financial markets. If you make, if you allow banks to become huge, not only one bank becomes huge, but they are also in the, in, interdependent. And suddenly this is sort of a, a, like a bomb where you already lit the fuse because at one point in time, one of those will run into trouble and then you have like a domino effect mm -hmm. as we saw 2008 and suddenly half your financial system is, is, is down the drain. So I think we also have to think about in a systemic way a little bit how we can handle that better or, or, or construct it better. Yes, um, but I'm not sure whether you can um, kind of anticipate any such event because even if you think of simpler systems in physics, for example, that have a uh, phase transition where the whole system flips into a completely different uh, scenario all of a sudden at a certain critical point, if you live in mm. that system and you don't really understand its mm. behavior and you're near the critical point, I'm not so sure how certain you can be or how aware you can be that you're close to a, a critical point where your system is going to go downhill or I something. I think the arguing would be you have to avoid that the system can come into such critical points. But even that, if yeah. you cannot identify such a point, how would you be able to, yeah. to tell you are approaching mm. such a point? There's a nice quote, and I don't know who said it, maybe maybe you know, uh, I think it's maybe Woody Allen or somebody, so who said, if, if you want to make God laugh, tell him about your plans. Yeah. <laughs> I, I really I love, think this is Woody Allen. Yeah, yeah, I yeah, think, yeah, uh, yeah. and I really love that statement because mm. um, there's so much. Um, I, I don't know. I really like it because you can think about it in many different ways and appreciate it uh, from many different angles. Uh, I, I really love that because it captures also what we are talking about here. So you cannot simply cope with the actual complexity of our world to an extent that you are able to control everything and manipulate everything. It's just. I would like to. I would like to to switch to. Um, to a final topic, which I think is important. And also you have a lot of, I'm asking also you because you have a lot of experience in that field as well. Now, considering all that, what we said now, means that we are living in a world that is not very predictable, where we have to be very aware of what's going on around us. We have to adjust our targets continuously and so on and so forth, all the things that you mentioned before. But my concrete question would be, are we educating people so that they can do that. I mean, we have universities, we have schools, and you, you're yourself an excellent academic uh, and also teach in universities, so you have a good idea of how our universities are working, also how our school system is working. And I'm honestly afraid that we are not doing the right things at the universities in the sense of we are educating people to drill very deep, going into a very narrow specialization, which is also required to a certain extent. But my feeling is we are not educating people well enough to, because we need these all-purpose people, if you want, these generalists, would be my guess. Do you have the impression that we're doing the right things here on universities, in science, in science incentives, whatever, whatever comes to your mind? Well, that's a very cool question. Uh, it touches upon many things. Um, let me start by, uh, I think, um, if your goal is, and I hope that's everybody's goal, uh, to have a fair society where everybody can, uh, you know, benefit the most from, you would have to kind of, um, think what the strategy for each individual person or role, like what's, uh, you know, like every person's, uh, like a civilian's point of view, what's, what's from a politician's point of view, what from an academic point of view, what is a, a good strategy, a good thing to do. Uh, for the individual person, the civil person, uh, I think it's, um, the, the most important thing is to educate yourself, being able to understand, to critically think, mm -hmm. to question things, and most uh, importantly, to question yourself. So because, you know, once you start working with tough problems, yeah. uh, that is some, something I think that I uh, experienced as being very a humbling experience because you, you simply experience the boundaries of your own mind very, uh, you know, vividly, and you see, okay, uh, I, I totally you know, I suck at this and it's just super complicated and you, you see that all the time. So you always question yourself. That is, uh, I think, what what is the most important thing 
uh, that people should acquire regardless of, of what role they, they take, but in particular the educational part, I think, for individuals. So I want to pick up, because I think this is really crucially important what you say, and also to come back to something you said before. Those things that are regular, structured, well described, these are exactly the things that are going to be automated, right? These are, the, or at least those that are most likely to be automated. Yes, I would so, say so my point would be, those jobs that we will have in the future will most likely be jobs that deal with wicked problems, with problems that are not so easily described. I mean, mm -hmm. unless you have mm -hmm. some manual labor that you can, for some reason, not automate, mm -hmm. like for instance mm -hmm. in healthcare stuff like that. But let's say more in the academic field, many academic fields, you will have a lot of things that will be automated. And all that you said would be critically important for people who do this, handle these complex problems. Uh, yes, I agree. So I think uh, I maybe, um, so you need both, right? You need yeah. those generalists and you yeah. need the specialists yeah. and they yeah. have to, to play Could, together yes. and join forces and tackle problems. Yes. So you really need both because generalists tend to be not so deep in any particular issue, but of course they have uh, yes. a good overview also uh, of other fields. And uh, I think that is very important, most definitely. Um, but still, in order to achieve that, you have to have an, a, a system for education how you, where you can train and educate people to become these critical mm -hmm. minds, you know, who are able to question everything and themselves also, and who can participate in a discussion, and they start a discussion uh, and they accept the fact when they begin a discussion that it could be that by the end of the day when the discussion is over that they have to accept the other opinion mm -hmm. if mm -hmm. it's just, yes. you know, if they have the better arguments. And in order to establish, I think, such a layer, you really have to, to train people uh, at a very early age to... to constantly question everything, yes. to be interested and open to things. The world we live in is so fascinating and that there are so many interesting things you can explore. Yes. Just start exploring and think always about these things, question yeah. them, and then I think such a mindset emerges, I would say. Yeah, but to, to, there's one question here that talks about digital competence, okay? Mm -hmm. uh, and this would be important. And um, I don't know, l l let, me, let me be a little bit, you know, let me be a little bit provocative, okay? Mm -hmm. My feeling is I couldn't agree more on all that you said, but my feeling is our education systems, and I'm talking about both the, the schools and the academic education systems, are going more and more into a school-like way. You sit in your classroom, you have like a multiple choice test, you are learning, you're not even reading by yourself anymore a whole book, you maybe just, what is the question, have to answer the test and stuff like that. This is exactly not... The, 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 the capabilities that would be yes, yes. what you did required, yes. number one. And number two, to the digital competence, my feeling is we are misjudging the importance of digital capabilities. I think, uh, I think the problem today is not that pupils or students cannot handle a computer or cannot do a Google search or cannot write a Word document. The problem is that they cannot assess if information is good or not. If information is reasonable, is, if the argument is good, mm -hmm. all of that, mm -hmm. and to learn that, I totally do not need a computer. Yes, I agree. So uh, I think here it's important that you try, so, you know, in math and also in physics and also in machine learning, it's the same concepts all over again. It's, it's a few concepts that are very successful, like optimization procedures and, and stuff like that. And I think it's important to understand this on a generic level, then you can understand many of those specific things and their, in particular the limitations uh, very well. Uh, but how do you, you cannot educate everybody to be a, a technician mm. or a mathematician. So the, the question is then, uh, and this is a much broader question, how can you, how can you establish really, uh, you know, an education for critical think, thinking? Uh, I, don't, I don't know. But uh, I think that would be very important. And, and just for, you know, I personally, with my kids, I have two kids, a daughter and a son, and I, uh, they're very young still, five and seven, but I, I kind of playfully explore mathematics, puzzles, questions, stuff like that with them together, also computers, because you can think of them uh, in a very mathematical way, and they enjoy it, and uh, I don't want to force it on them or, or anything, but I just want to expose them as early as possible uh, to this kind of 
way of how you think when you approach a problem and how you think about a system and how you think about nature. And children take that on very, very vividly usually in that age particularly. Absolutely, absolutely. And by the way, we see here another, I think we cannot, we cannot solve the whole world today. I think we solved a little bit maybe, but not, <laughs> not the whole world. But I think you, 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 you come upon another, I think, very critical question. I mean, you and your children, obviously, I mean, you are very educated, you take time for children, all of, so your children are, in a sense, um, in a very good starting position because they are probably in an environment, in an educated environment, they probably have books, they, I don't know, they are not put in front of the TV from eight to four just to be silent, so all of that thing. So they are in, in, a, in a very good, have a very good starting point. Now, so I'm not worried about your kids, but when we think about the society, I mean, there are a lot of people who have hard jobs, who don't have the time, who mm -hmm. probably don't even have the education. And they rely on the schools. They rely... Yes, on, yes. They, because, you, honestly, in whatever school your children will go, they will, they will come out fine. Because they have, you know, they have, they have the starting point. But that's not true for everyone. Uh, absolutely. And uh, the, the question is really, I, I mean, I think the, the offer is there, out there on the table, so people can take it up. But the question is, you, you have to... I mean, I don't really know the answer to that question, but uh, I can just, um, I think if, if every single one of us tries to reach out to people, try to reach those people which are hard to reach, mm -hmm. also which are underprivileged and who are not able to, to kind of benefit from this, um, that would be great. So in, in Graz, for example, I'm from Graz, we have, uh, we have projects where we kind of, um, um, we call them Learning House, for example, uh, which is also funded, I think, by the Red Cross, where uh, underprivileged children are uh, being, you know, after school, they, they can go there, they can learn uh, about, um, you know, about the, the stuff that they're supposed to learn in school, and they are kind of, um, you know, they play games and, and things like that. So that's a small project, of course, but that those are possible steps, I think, how you can, how you can make that happen on a global scale, meaning like Austria-wide, uh, or, or even Europe, or, or in, globally. I don't know how you, but you should really try and, and establish such, such an environment where everybody can really um, learn these kind of critical thinking from an early age on. Andreas, I'm afraid we have to wrap up here for the moment. I think we might come back again later on to, to one or other comments. Yeah, I think the bottom line is, we are living in a complex world that is hard to predict, and a lot of things have to adapt to these, uh, to these challenges, particularly considering the environment we live in, the, the climate crisis, the complex global uh, political, financial uh, situations that you're in. So it's certainly not going to get easier. Yes. And my feeling is that a lot of our systems are not where we should be, where they should be, actually. We cannot solve everything now. We talked a little bit about education. Uh, Maybe one, uh, I want to turn now to Lucas, but I'm honestly... <laughs> You're little, torn. <laughs> a little bit afraid, no, no, I'm afraid, honestly, because, <laughs> because, because we, we opened up so many complicated problems. And the law is here to solve them all. Exactly, and you are not here to solve them. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we talked about the complexity and the, undetermin the undeterministic yeah, world we live in. You are having a lot of fun as a lawyer, no? To be honest, uh, as, as an attorney and as a partner of, of a global law firm, complexity is great for our business. For your business, yes. Uh, not so much uh, for, for the economy as a whole. And society. And society as a whole. So the, the, the interesting puzzle really is how, how do we end up with such a complex legal landscape where we all agree that simplicity is what, what we would need. Could you explain, because we talked a lot about physical paradigms and so on, could you maybe explain what simplicity would be in your legal terms? So what would, what, what would simplicity be for you as a lawyer or if you put yourself into the shoes of a politician or a lawmaker, what would you say is simplicity in legal terms? The biggest challenge in the legal arena, I would think currently is, and really has been for, for at least a, a decade or two, is that politicians tend to be purely reactive in the face of technological developments. That is, to react to perceived 
ills in society caused by technological developments and reacting to these perceived ills by adopting new laws that are very narrow in, in their design in the sense that they're, they're only meant to address the particular perceived ill. Because this is what, what is currently being discussed in the media, and this is what, what everybody's talking about. And, and there are simply a lot of political incentives for a politician to react to that perceived You appear Ill. strong because you made the legislation to solve the problem, quote-unquote. And unless the law you're passing has basically the name of the problem in its title, you're, you're missing the point, politically speaking. So we end up with a lot of laws that address perceived ills, the problem being, however... And very specific ones, no? That they're not only very specific, they're also outdated. Because what is being discussed today in the media are, in many if not most cases, things that, that on, on the graph of any hype, mm -hmm. already on the downward way. When we are discussing things in the media, they, they're already being hyped to a level that they're not actually today's problem, they're yesterday's problem. So like to come to artificial intelligence, as soon as you're going to discuss artificial intelligence in legal terms, in 10 years maybe, we will already have lost the majority of the momentum. The, the, the problem is firstly that, that the political process is necessarily a, a reactive one and all incentives that politicians face are are reactive in, in nature. So I'm, I'm, I'm not blaming politicians, they're, they're rational in, in their behavior. Nonetheless, they're reacting to things that are already problems of the past. And this, this challenge, this problem, is aggravated by the fact that the legislative process takes a long time. Uh, in particular in the European Union, until all the EU member states can agree on something, easily four years, sometime, sometimes even longer. And until then, the national legislator transposes that piece of uh, EU legislation into national law. It's again another two years. So we're really, it's, it's as if the legislator was politicians were driving a huge truck by only looking into the rear mirror and trying to steer by looking at the roadkill they see in the rear mirror. <laughs> that is, they themselves ran over. Oh, of course they did. <laughs> and as, as legal practitioners, whether as, as an attorney like myself or, or as an in-house lawyer, you're trying to navigate, navigate that very complex landscape of roadkills that this truck leaves behind. And that's not how the law should work. Ideally, you would want somebody to be looking through the front window, and with all the uncertainties and complexities in today's world, try to anticipate what the problems of tomorrow will be. And that takes not only a lot of foresight, but even more importantly, a lot of humility. Uh, unknown unknowns were, were discussed Humility before. in the sense that we just confess that we know not very much. Exactly, that we, we admit to be regulating things that we do not know. And that means to not make a law that you can write a press release about and say, oh, we've, we've solved this great new problem and here's the great solution, but to make rules that are of a much more general nature. And the actual solution that will come out of this process is not being produced by the politician, not by the lawmaker, but by the people applying the law that is necessarily vague, vague on purpose, that, that are applying these vague rules in practice. These are people working at public authorities, working as judges, as attorneys, that break down vague rules to produce concrete solutions. That's how the law used to work. So that, that's, that, that, that would be your ideal or your idea of a simple uh, legal system where the rules allow for a certain amount of ambiguity, gives basic frameworks and gives more responsibility to those people who then execute the laws. Am I, am I getting that right? 
Exactly. And in that way, the law is, I think, a, a much, I wouldn't say more suitable, but easier to use tool to address complexity uh, than, than mathematics. Yeah, but we don't trust people. I mean, we don't want people to to make judgments, right? Where would we be if a judge judges? <laughs> then <laughs> we cannot automate him with the artificial intelligence that <laughs> Andreas develops. And that is exactly the point. We need trust in order to manage complexity, in particular in the legal arena. And, and having that trust as a politician, saying I, I don't have all the answers, what I have is trust in our judiciary to apply purposefully vague rules in a way that will make sense in the world of tomorrow. I would really like to take this on and see if you agree. You said we need trust and in the legal arena, and I would personally say not only in the legal arena, everywhere where rules are made, because all the rules could be made in a large company, let's say a large company or a large university or whatever, you call it, a large structure. You also have rules there that tries to regulate how people behave, I mean, what work they do and how they, and so on. And my feeling is from obs observing large companies, large organizations, I would say we see the same problem there. It starts, or in politics, the same thing. We lose trust. Building up trust is a very hard thing when you lost it. So what we do, we make one regulation after the other that tries to regulate every specific problem we notice here and there and in, in whole create a lot of damage to the whole system. That would be my theory. It's, it's damage to the system and it's long-term damage. Long, yes. Because exactly, politically exactly. speaking, it is practically impossible to, to eliminate a law that was passed whatever ill it was that was being addressed there, saying we don't need this piece of legislation anymore is basically saying I'm, I'm not taking this problem seriously enough. Politically speaking, mm. it's a non-starter. We have in, in other uh, jurisdictions, we have a tradition of passing laws with sunset clauses. Basically a law saying that this law will lose effect, will automatically expire in five years. Mm -hmm. Again, an expression of humility mm -hmm. that where you're addressing a specific problem, you are recognizing that this might not be the relevant problems five years down the road. So this is exactly what, what Andreas said before with the moving target, that you actually are forced then to reevaluate and figure out if the target is still the same? Unfortunately, in Europe, we don't have that tradition. No, I mean, I mean this idea would, yes. would follow exactly yes, that logic, exactly, right? Yes, exactly the same, same logic. Unfortunately, one that we don't have in Europe. There we are many cannot have it in our legal system. Or we, we could. Don't. We could. We, we easily. Could. It's just that we don't have it in, in our legal tradition. In the United States, it's very common. Um, in Europe, it's not, which is why on, on, on the national level as well as on the EU level, there are many pieces of legislation where basically at the time the legislation was passed, everybody knew this is not going to work, but it's still a law on the books. Um, and it will probably remain so for another decade or two until everybody who was involved in, in passing that piece of legislation has uh, left the political arena, so there's no political damage being done when, when uh, we, we do away with these regulations. But I interrupted you before with an interjection. You mentioned something that there is some parts of law that go back historically older, I think. If, uh, if, uh, did, did you want to go to the direction that they have a different a different uh, conceptual framework as the ones we are doing now? We have, in many areas of law, are working with statutes, with, with uh, legislative texts that are not just decades, but centuries old. Uh, our civil code is from uh, the 19th century. Uh, the fundamental rights, the, the civil rights uh, that we have in Europe are from the 1950s. Hmm. And we can perfectly apply these fundamental rights. Constitutional courts have no problem adjudicating very current technologically driven cases, applying these rules that are very general and on purpose vague. On purpose vague in the sense that they are supposed, if I interpret you correctly, they are supposed to give, how should I say, 
describe a fundamental idea, but be wise enough not to specify it in so many details that it's not applicable if something changes a little bit. To give you an example, the fundamental right to data protection uh, basically say, says that the state may not collect personal data about anyone unless there's a law that authorizes it and the processing of that data is justified. Well, what does justified mean? mean? Well, it's a proportionality test, uh, a balancing of interests. That's very vague. It's not technological, technologically specific. There is no Internet of Things mentioned. There is no Internet mentioned. No hard no disks. No, I don't know any of that, right? There is no need to, which is why this fundamental right has withstood and will withstand the test of times for decades and centuries to come because it was written with the humility of the understanding that we cannot know what will happen in a century, but nonetheless need rules that will continue to apply today the same way as in 100 years. They will just have to be interpreted based on a different set of facts and, and, and based on, on, on different realities, but the purpose of the rule will still be the same, and that is, in my example, to protect individuals from government overreach. Mm -hmm. but, but again, this requires a society with a certain amount of trust. Trust in, 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 in institutions, trust in charges, maybe also ch uh, trust in procedures. And trust also within organizations. Mm -hmm. um, what we often see, this applies to, to the legislative process the same way as it applies to uh, rulemaking within a global corporation. There is little political risk in passing a lot of rules because you can always say, oh yeah, yeah, I passed the rule to address this, to address that. I maybe didn't think of another phenomenon that I couldn't foresee, but I'm happy to pass another rule to address that. So there are a lot of political incentives within any organization, with any system, to make a lot of rules. To do the opposite, to pass few rules, exposes everyone to individual political risk mm -hmm. as a politician, as, as a CEO. So we, we have the tendency to pass more and more rules with the perverse counter effect of of making each of these rules less effective. Mm. So we have a yes. lot of rules that just exist in theory, that are laws on the book, mm -hmm. but have no effect in practice. And if our intent is to, to, to influence the real world that we live in, our primary objective should be to make effective rules, first and foremost. Mm -hmm and then care about whether the rules are, are, are that up-to-date or anything. An up-to-date rule is no good if it's not effective, it's not being enforced, not complied with in practice. I would like to, I see two, two aspects here. The one that you mentioned last is, is the effectiveness in the sense that uh, an existing legal framework, framework is executed and followed up. Let's hold that thought for a moment. For, for, but before, uh, I would like to come again to the complexity of the law and the effects of it. Let me try to give an example that I read about with my layman's terms and leave it to your interpretation. Uh, there are these Basel 1, 2, 3 regulations. And to my understanding, Basel 1 was a relatively short uh, uh, regulation. And then, if I inter interpret you correctly, it happens what happens today there was this edge case and that edge case, and it came into the regulation, Basel II much more, Basel III much more, and suddenly with Basel III we have a document that is, I don't know, 10, 20 times larger than the first one, and leads to, I think, 10,000 uh, lines of uh, primary, or pages of primary law in the US, for instance. Now, what we achieved is now that Basel I, you as one lawyer maybe understood and could handle, and Basel III in the US, you probably need a law firm that is specializing on that, so what have, we, what have we won by that process? Except that probably we have unintended side effects because the ones that we want to regulate, the big companies, are the ones who have the law firms, who find the loopholes, but I maybe as a small financial, uh, I don't know, company or other company, I maybe 
Yeah, the roadkill you mentioned before. It's really two, two effects at play here, I would, would say. One is, as you rightly pointed out, I'm creating adverse effects with such complexity. What, what in many cases the regulator or legislator wants to achieve is to rein in large market players. And the irony is that they're doing exactly the opposite. Mm. Because by having such complex rules in place, you're effectively foreclosing the market to new competitors. You're effectively creating a barrier of entry into that highly regulated market. If you and I want to open up a bank. Or insurance for that matter. Or an insurance corporation. Not going to happen. It's a non-starter. We needed hundreds of millions of start capital to build up all of this infra infrastructure before we have the first customer and the first insurance premium, right? So, although the regulated entities in these highly regulated industries are rightly complaining about the burden of regulation, they are at the same time, ironically, the greatest beneficiaries of it because they sooner or later experience completely foreclosed market that makes it almost impossible for, for new market entries to compete. And the more indirect effect is that the regulator is sooner or later only dealing with the same companies for decades on. And that leads to a, a phenomenon that, particularly in the United States, has been researched very well, that is, is being called capture. The regulatory authority that is only dealing with the same regulated entities, they're more or less the same size, have more or less the same and problems. And same consultants. You and have the same two and three, four large companies who could audit you. And, and the same consultants. So to some extent, you also have a, a, a revolving door. that But always the same three or four. That reinforces yeah. this effect. But also institutionally speaking, if as a as a regulator, as an institution, you're only concerned with the interests of a, a small set of companies because you're not dealing with the consumers that, that are indirectly affected by the regulation. You're dealing with the regulated large corporate players. You will sooner or later take on a view that mirrors the view of the regulated company. You're getting captured by their there's challenges. To some extent, that, that makes a regulator um, market-driven, that makes a regulator uh, produce a, a business-friendly business environment. So there are advantages to this, too. But it also makes it more difficult for the regulator to, to take an, an outsider's view on, on what is happening in this ecosystem, since they're very much an integral part of that ecosystem. Uh, a second part that that simply I, I, I have to bring in here in, in response to your question is that the, the answer to every problem that regulators seem to find is more rules. Whereas I believe the, the more fruitful answer would be more efficiency. In particular, more efficient and effective enforcement of the rules that we already have. So in many cases, we have great rules uh, over and time, lack of enforcement. Yeah, mm -hmm. over time they, they become increasingly complex. They have never been truly enforced. Let, so let, let's go, let's go to this topic of enforcement because we held the thought before. So, what what in your opinion on, on your experience is holding us back to enforce rules that we might have even? Firstly, I think it's a lack of political incentives to, to be enforce honest. the rules. Yes, uh -huh, okay. because enforcing the rules doesn't bring you any, any plus points as a politician, because you're not in charge of enforcement. That's an independent agency mm. doing the enforcement. You can't uh, claim to have done this. They, they're an independent agency. They did this. So there's little incentive for a politician to say, uh, I'm going to grant that, uh, that independent agency an additional budget so that they can hire another 50 people to do proper enforcement. That's to the contrary. Where do I get that budget from? Do I have to raise taxes in order to balance the budget? It's uh, all unpopular questions. And the authority that is being tasked with enforcing the rules, in many cases, 
simply isn't appropriately staffed to do what they should be doing. Plus the phenomenon of capture that we talked about yeah. before yeah. makes it difficult for them to be really tough in their enforcement. Um, sometimes the authorities tasked with enforcement don't have the experience to do proper enforcement. So they are kind of reluctant to mm. really impose a fine because mm. they kind of have the feeling that if they do impose a fine, chances are uh, the, the appeals court will, will lift the fine because they, they, they did something wrong in the first instance proceedings. So there, there are political risks to doing enforcement. If, if you're not enforcing, there are very little risks from a political perspective. I would like to come back to the first the first point that you mentioned, and my feeling is that the understaffing, they're not they're not uh, giving enough, uh, yeah, also means uh, to to uh, to these units. Also, you need a lot of technical skills in some, because, particularly in our field now, we're talking about information technology, and when you want to do something here, you need technical experience. You need not just someone who not shouldn't be impolite, not just someone who's just a legal expert. You also need a lot of technical expertise, and my feeling is we have a second actually quite unpleasant phenomenon that these units are quite capable to handle smaller perpetrators in the sense of smaller companies, local companies, because I always, I always was joking with friends, if I would have started, let's say we two would have started Uber in Vienna, U I mean Uber in the sense of the business model of Uber in Vienna, yeah. I think we would have been sued out of operation within with, a week. Within a week. And, and, and really big time, we would have had big time repercussions. A large company like Uber comes on from the US and they even say in the boardroom, uh, it is not important how the legal situation is, the question is, can it be enforced? And when you're fast and big enough and bold enough, you cannot enforce it. Then we set actually a very questionable sign here. Because we say, if you're big enough, if you're Google, Amazon, Facebook, you name it, you can, in principle, do whatever you want because our agencies are not capable to handle you. But if you're small, if it's like uh, our, our, our uh, ride-sharing company, we are in deep trouble. That cannot be the idea of the law, no? It's really two systematic challenges. One is the, the pure, simple resource challenge that if you're basically uh, letting two people at the authority uh, handle an enforcement action uh, against a large international player, uh, and for them this is a strategic issue, they will have dozens of people in-house, uh, plus three times uh, that, if necessary, from external advisors and law firms to defend this case. Uh, so you, you're looking at, at an imbalance of resources. And I think even more challenging from, from a systematic political perspective, you would have to, to be able to really enforce certain rules against large international players, you would have to have international enforcement hmm. authorities. Hmm. And this is something that in today's political climate, unfortunately, particularly in the EU, the EU member states are very reluctant to consider. There's only one area of law where the European Commission has direct enforcement authority, and that is competition law, antitrust law. Everything else is subject with, really basically everything else is subject to national enforcement. And if you're dealing with an international player established in the United States, or in China for that matter, well, which national authority will pick up this work and do the, 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 the really hard work of enforcing, of dealing with all the juris international jurisdictional issues. There are, there are studies on this that if you make, whether it's people or, or institutions, if, if you make more than eight institutions responsible of anything, mm. It's a guarantee it's not for happening. nothing happening. Yeah. And this is what we're often practicing in the European Union and then wondering why nothing is happening. Well, we, knew, we would need a little bit of political guts on, on the individual member state level to say, we can't handle this nationally. We need an EU level enforcement authority. The, the EU has value and we need to realize that value against mm. yes. large international phenomenon. As a, la as a la last aspect, to also get back a little bit again to the digitization issues, I would like, I give you again a rather provocative statement how I s see um, the situation. In my opinion, we see more than once, or we saw it more than once in the last 10, 20 years, when new 
technical systems, IT systems, showed certain effects on society. Let's, encryption is an, it could be an example, or social networks could be an example, or you name it, bitcoins could be an example, whatever. I, I found a discussion that was, seemed very immature to me. On the, one, on the one hand, you had like the nerds, the technicians, who hardly ever moved because they loved their freedom in the internet or whatnot, and everyone else was an idiot that didn't understand the technology and, and was like an internet ausdrucker, as we say in uh, Germany, and so like someone who prints out the internet and these idiots, they don't know what's going on. So that was the one, the one bunker, and the other bunker was maybe the legal system or the lawyers who wanted everything exactly black and white, and were also not willing to make one step in maybe open up a little bit in thinking. So I, I'm, I'm not judging the lawyers here, only I'm judging both sides. My feeling is that we have a much too deep bunker mentality on both sides that hinders us from making reasonable uh, regulations in important topics. I, is this just my, my weird impression or, or how, what is your opinion? No, I, I, I fully appreciate this, this impression that you have and to some extent I'm... I'm Sometimes I feel I'm, I'm living it. I'm, on the one hand, I'm, I'm a partner at a global international firm representing global corporations. On the other hand, I'm, I'm a card-carrying member of the American Civil Liberties Union and, and a member of the Electronic Frontier Foundation. So I'm, I'm very much a, a civil rights advocate in private. And I, I very much do understand both sides of, of this debate. There are some of these debates, at least, where it is indeed uh, a basic yes, no question. There, there are cases where we're talking about basically the regulation of technology in a way that you're either allowing or you're prohibiting the use of certain encryption technologies, for example. And if you're saying that you're allowing the use of encryption technologies, let's say end-to-end -end encryption, well, certain types of surveillance will simply not be possible, period. On the other hand, if you're saying that you're outlawing uh, these types of encryption uh, algorithms, then you're, you're fundamentally weakening the security and privacy of our global information mm. society. So th there are some discussions where I think it's, it's indeed a, a very black and white discussion. So there are some topics where we have such tipping points, you're seeing such technical, but this cannot be all, right? No. But by far not, and you're absolutely right in the sense that most discussions, unfortunately, people dig in and, and only see their point of view where a more, uh, let's say, measured uh, approach, uh, the, the road in between is the, the road uh, least taken, unfortunately. What, what do we have to change so that our legal system can really... Because I really think that we have a digitization problem in the sense of that, we are, as I mentioned at the beginning, that we talk constantly about innovation, but we're not really talking about progress. How does this really progress our society? And I think that the legal system has an important role to play there, and it's, under, it's underrated in its importance. What Do you have some... some tangible ideas what we could do to, to change that? Uh, first, stop making any new rules. Mm. The ones we have are plenty. Mm. Uh, I don't need a new law regulating AI. I have basically one article in the general data protection regulation that is more or less saying the same thing that a directive said that was passed in 1995. And that's all I need to deal with with the risks of artificial intelligence. So we, we already have an AI law, if you will, just none that a politician can claim as a victory. So not making any new rules would be a good start. Thank you very much. Uh, My head is still spinning a little bit. Uh, thank you very much for both of you for your enlightening comments. Um, Alexander, I would uh, add another question from our audience. Uh, uh, first, thank you for, for your input and for your comments. Uh, we have several uh, comments here. Um, 
commenting your comments. Um, we are misjudging the importance of digital competence. Great comment one of our uh, members uh, is, uh, is writing. And we have a special uh, question uh, regarding the GDPR. Um, maybe, maybe I ask you, uh, Lucas, um, do you see any gap um, between, uh, between uh, GDPR violations Uh, by a partitional uh, state or state-owned companies versus private companies who are facing one fine after another? Is there a, a gap between those two sides of business in Europe? To some extent, uh, yes, certainly that the public sector, uh, very broadly speaking, uh, is, is not seeing that much enforcement action. Um, in particular, public authorities in most member states Uh, are simply not subject to fines, making enforcement actions not that attractive for, for an, an enforcement authority, because that's not really a very nice press release to write. There's no fine being imposed. Um, uh, the GDPR is really, I, I think, a, a poster child of, of the challenges of regulating in, in, in a very dynamic, technological, and and, 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 and also from a business perspective, complex and, and quickly evolving space. And in many respects, I, I think the GDPR is, is failing at that, mm -hmm. quite, quite critically speaking. Yeah, but as you have mentioned before, it's based on fundamental rights in Europe, and that's that's maybe um, on the other side the, the right way to approach uh, such technology uh, uh, difficulties and, and issues. Um, and um, Alexander, you have, uh, um, thank you for, for uh, taking some of the questions and input from the audience uh, during your moderation. Uh, the digital competence was one of the topics and uh, to underline that and to elaborate that, um, is there maybe one, one audience member's writing um, Uh, the problem that only competence uh, recognizes competence, speaking of, it, of our politicians, um, in terms of uh, technology trends and technology issue, issues our society is facing. Is there a lack of, of competence on the, on the political um, area? My feeling would be that we should see this on a more general level again, because, I mean, okay, today we talk about digital uh, resilience, But I mean, we live in a world where a lot of competences are needed from climate to, I don't know, energy to whatnot. So this comes back to one thing that I discussed with uh, Andreas also earlier. I simply think we need more generalists in science, but also in companies and in, in politics. I had like 25 years ago when I was studying still chemistry, I was once at a conference in Switzerland and there was an old professor sitting there and he told me, you know, We are not going in a good direction. Like 10 years ago, this was like, he meant the 80s at that time, the CEOs of the large companies, like of the chemical company, he was a chemist, and of the, I don't know what company, car company was, came from the car making. Today, these are all lawyers, or people who studied economics, whatever that is supposed to mean. So I think this is not a good trend. And why? Because we're all afraid of trust. We're just legalizing everything, in my opinion. Then you need to have a lawyer or something like that Why do you need to be a lawyer to be a politician? Mm -hmm. I mean, as you see, this is not always the case, but I mean, I hope they have lawyers that help them in expressing that in the right form. So I think we need more generalists with general knowledge and education on all of that leading positions. Yeah, and nobody's playing chess anymore, you know, besides on, on the stage here. <laughs> yeah. um, so thanks again for the discussion and for your engagement and participation. Uh, dear audience, uh, we have a 10 minutes.